Hello everyone, this is the video lecture that complements uh, the book From Social Science to Data Science uh, by me, Bernie Hogan, and published by Sage. Uh, this is chapter one, Introduction, or Thinking of Life at Scale. So in this particular chapter, the learning goals are as follows. We want to understand and critique the notion of DIKW as a framework for data and, and learning about data. We want to think about data beyond how it's presented, uh, towards thinking about it as a distribution we can make a claim about. We want to consider how we can create workable code that is modular and practical, um, and want to th think about how we can apply the free mnemonic uh, in order to determine how extensively you should develop your code, and then how you can use pseudocode to plan your to, pl to plan your work before you go on. The first thing we're going to want to do, though, is talk about data science. What is it? What is social data science? So data science as a paradigm. We might think of it as an emerging approach to science that extends beyond statistics towards math and engineering and computer science, at least on one side. On the other side, it draws liberally from the social sciences, particularly, for example, like linguistics going to, to computational linguistics or geography going to geographic information systems. Now, statistics tend to focus, and this would be certainly um, since R.A. Fisher, on generalizability and representatives, re representativeness of samples of a population. Uh, we want to know, given uh, a population and given some ob observations from that, maybe randomly distributed, what can we say about the population? How confident can we be in that sample? Um, of course, statistics, the name, comes from the notion of a state and the state being able to um, measure the population and make estimates of that without having to ask everybody everything all the time. Uh, now, from statistics, we have a lot of really compelling and useful algorithms and measurements uh, that are a real central part of data science. But data science tends to be slightly different or focus on slightly different approaches and questions. Um, you tend to have access to vast streaming or complete data, such as every comment on a forum or every comment in a thread, and instead focus us on how to understand that data, how to classify it, how to describe it, and how to predict things within these vast samples, um, but also to be careful about how to construct or filter them. So we can't use usually all of Twitter all the time. Um, but we don't necessarily want to randomly sample from Twitter either. We want to think carefully about, you know, are we going to focus on everything with a particular hashtag or everything that mentions a certain word or from a certain person? And so those questions uh, are not just about how we generalize, but how we sculpt the data that we're going to first access and then make uh, some claims about. I mean, but that said, it's less useful to press further in distinguishing the fields. It's, you know, data science isn't this, or statistics must be that. I mean, there's no need to do a gatekeeping or get territorial. Rather, we might consider these approaches uh, to knowledge rather than domains of knowledge. So we might think, how can I ask a different question by using uh, the techniques and approaches of those from a, a particular paradigm? rather than saying, what is the right way to ask a question, or to, uh, to say, what is the right um, you know, approach? So certainly in sociology, we concern ourselves with space. It's not just that you do it in geography. Um, and everyone concerns themselves with language. And so these are approaches to knowledge, and data science, I think, is a really useful one. But what is it? Well. I mean, to the extent that we need a, a definition, uh, I'm offering here a, a provisional one. Now, you'll notice, of course, I have me talking up here in the corner, so that will truncate some of the headers. In this case, it's like data science and social data science. I'm going to pop me back up there. And so we might think that data science uh, is the science of operationalization of data. We might take a concept and think, um, what data can we use to measure that? Or what data is available that might measure it? We might have a bunch of data and think, how can we classify or cluster that data? How can it represent something that we, um, that we think is meaningful? Um, in the early days of social media, people would be, of course, very interested in churn. How many people are going to stay on this site? And then interested in attention. How much attention are they giving to the site? How can we sell that attention to advertisers? Uh, if people are 
coming and going on the site. They're not very dedicated. If they're ignoring advertisements, the advertisers think it's not worth very much value. So we really want to uh, think about people are operationalizing these broad concepts. The concepts are things that they want to work, and they use data in order to measure it. Here we have an example of a friendship. Well, how many messages shared between two people will be enough to represent a friendship? If we send a thousand messages a, uh, a year, would that be a friendship? Would colleagues do that even if they weren't friends? Well, maybe. Um, so does it matter the time that the messages are sent? Are they sent at, at home? Are they sent in the evening? Are they sent in a, in a burst? Or are they sent very steady? Does it matter what the content of the messages are? Uh, whether we can know that content or not. They say, hey, friend, I think things are great. Versus like, dear sir or madam. Um, that might be a revealing matter to assess friendship. Same with peer relationships. Do we send uh, messages to the same people? Do we all part of a group of people who message each other? Um, and finally, context. The context of the measurement, either in terms of the media, uh, which we often call a platform, say, on Facebook versus on Twitter, or other forms of context, such as um, with respect to um, uh, matters of our own identity. Are we sharing messages with people of a, a group that we would, uh, we would see ourselves in, uh, maybe a member of the LGBT community or a certain racial or ethnic group? Would that make a difference to friendship? So what data can help us answer these questions, and how can we test that answer? How can we come up with a question that might be falsifiable such that we can know whether or not our claims are, um, are really robust when we go out and observe the world. Now that example was a very social example. So we might think, you know, social data science is thus the science of the operationalization of social life. Um, that is, how do we operationalize concepts from the social world in such a way that we can either um, see them in data we can already access or get data in order to access that. Now, this is not just finding the true concept. What's the true form of friendship? Or the true meaning of a Facebook friend, whether or not it's a friendship. Uh, it's not about attaching a dollar value to things. What we're, uh, we're not interested in seeing how much a friendship is worth in a financial sense, even if that's a, a question that someone might ask maybe in economics. Rather, what we're trying to do is find a workable value um, for the accretion of knowledge. We want to continually know more about the world in some ways. And the world changes, and our knowledge about it needs to change as well. So finding workable values, where we might say right now, um, sending lots of messages on Facebook, but not on Microsoft Teams or Slack, might be a strong indicator of friendship or a provisionally useful indicator of friendship. Now, within the data science world and within a, a lot of places where we try to gather understanding with data, um, people will come up with a way of um, characterizing that. One from the information visualization literature that I quite like is called DIKW, and it stands for a hierarchy from data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Now, is it really a hierarchy? Well, we'll pause for a second on that. First, data would be measurements of phenomena. Uh, data is the plural of datum. And a datum is a, is a measurement, or a, a relative measurement, initially. Now, uh, even though it's data is a plural, we don't uh, often write it as in plural. We don't say data are, we say data is. Why would we do that? Well, because data is seen as a mass noun, like, uh, uh, like rice is a mass noun. So you have one grain of rice or many grains of rice. In that sense, uh, mass nouns are normally things that we don't count. We don't measure how many units of data we have, we simply just have lots of data. Um, information might be considered as signals from that data. Gregory Bateson has this lovely phrase that says, uh, information refers to a difference that makes a difference. Uh, so we might say that there's a difference between, you know, uh, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Like, I keep doing that, and you're going to guess, you're going to guess what the next one's going to be. It's either going to be a one or a zero. We're not getting a lot of new information, even if we're getting new data. But if I go zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, all of a sudden the pattern is slightly more complicated. And so we're able to tell that there is a difference in there. But now if I keep doing that, then 
you know, it's still going to have more repetition. Now, the different ones and the different zeros might make a make use from a signal point of view. Certainly with music, uh, we would give all sorts of these zeros and ones to go for the pitch and the amplitude and whatever. And, and that just, we make the song or we can represent the song from the encoding of the sound that goes up and down. Now, what is knowledge then? Uh, a lot of people will ask that question. And, and the provisional answer here is that knowledge is information situated or understood in co context. So, for example, if I go 0001, 0001, um, that might not make a lot of sense until you realize that that's a drum pattern for a certain kick drum or a snare or something. And we understand that that creates swing or creates, creates rhythm in the song. What we're doing is we're situating these signals within some sort of context that allows us to understand maybe where that signal came from. Now, what about wisdom then? We don't re really talk about wisdom much in, uh, in academic work or uh, in public really anymore, which is kind of odd to think about. You know, we don't want to say that we're wise or anything. And so uh, it might be a bit presumptuous. But I still think it's a worthy, worthwhile goal to consider wisdom and consider wisdom as knowledge that we can apply to a different context. So uh, the wisdom can be varying levels of general. Um, but imagine you... You cook a recipe, and uh, you know that when you cook it in a different oven, you might have to alter things about the temperature or the time. You didn't have to go to that oven ahead of time to know that you might want to alter something. You just have a general sense that different ovens have slightly different time requirements for your, for your baking or, or whatever. And so wisdom is allows us to take the things that we know about signals within the context and use them outside of that context. Now, DIKW is not bad, but it's certainly not perfect. Do we start with data? Well, the world creates data, but uh, it creates data based on a lot of assumptions. You know, who is on a platform or who isn't? Does all the knowledge need to go through this schema in order to become wisdom? I mean, that's certainly contentious. We... How we arrive at wisdom cognitively, naturally, um, is a subject for psychologists and may or may not um, be relevant right here. But it is worth noting that we do learn things through experience and that we integrate them into, uh, into our ideas. But that experience happens in the real world, doesn't necessarily happen from data. That's a different kind of, that's a different kind of knowledge, one that we might consider scientific knowledge. Um, but in reality, uh, we can arrive at things through slightly different ways. And so I want to kind of step back from DIKW a bit. And before, before we just run from data and go, here's the data, now how's, how do we get the information and the knowledge from it? We think, where does the data come from? So I want to go back and think that data comes from phenomena. Phenomena is the world. It's just out there. Now, when I say the world, I don't mean Earth. Uh, uh, and in, in the future, maybe that won't even be relevant. But uh, I mean the, the universe of, uh, of known or knowable things, just like everything out there is the, is the world. And so the world just simply exists. It's just there. So to interact with the world, we take information and we encode it, and then we react to that information. Now, we do that through our own sense perception. We do that through uh, our eyes, taking in light and to color, and through our ears, taking in sound. And through sensors, we can take it and then encode it in very digital ways. We can also create data through participating in the world, either by speaking and talking to other people or writing things as text and encoding them. But the things that we encode as text uh, are not necessarily the things that we, that we want to analyze. They're things that are like the things that we want to analyze. We might be curious about extroversion, and we don't have... Uh, we don't go out and ask everyone, are you an extrovert? Are you an extrovert? Instead, well, in a more um, classic statistics way, we would sample a population and then we would uh, give them a, a series of questions about extroversion. Do you like talking to people at parties? Uh, compile that and then compare it with other measures. But we, don't, we wouldn't do that for everyone on Twitter. We wouldn't do that for everyone on Facebook or WeChat. Are there other signals of extroversion? Are there things that are correlated with extroversion. So we might think, how can we operationalize phenomena, the stuff that is out there in the world, 
as the things that we want for data. Um, we can either think that we're, we operationalize that by looking at the data that's already there or creating different data or maybe even looking at data that's already there in a different way. So we might say, you know, things like, well, is every friendship the same? No, of course not. Um, so how would we know what to measure for a friendship? Do we go out and ask everyone and thus we have everyone's opinion of a, of a friendship? Do we look at academic literature and see what other people have said is a friendship? Or do we just say, well, it's a friend on Facebook. Simple enough. Could it be a friend on Facebook um, or a friend on Twitter? Maybe it's Twitter if we uh, both follow each other and know each other's real name. You know, as we go along, we're going to need to find different ways to operationalize concepts in different platforms, in different places. A friendship might look different on Reddit than it does on Facebook or within some email. It might still be a friendship to me or to you, but it would look different from the data. And so we have to operationalize it differently. So instead of just thinking DIKW, what information can we get from the data, we should go back and first um, think critically about how that data was created, who sculpted the world in some way that produces that data. Did we do it by writing a survey that people respond to or um, interacting with a giant platform that has little text boxes that say right here or click this? To that end, to generate interesting research questions, we should think beyond the interface. Whether we're looking at uh, any platform, Reddit, Twitter, WeChat, we're, we're seeing a way in which the people who make that platform have designed a series of interactions or um, put forward a series of ways for us to interact with the world. We can maybe reply or reply all. Maybe we can give a reply that disappears. Some chat programs allow you to drop images in the chat and some don't. Well, that's not just an interface matter, but then once we, we get the data from there, we can think beyond that interface. Uh, how many people use pictures in their Facebook chats? Well, I, I don't know. But the thing is, you don't necessarily need to go through everybody's chat in order to, to get that. In fact, going through people's chats can be considered quite inappropriate and sometimes technically not even possible. But maybe uh, Facebook has a record of how many images are preloaded in a chat. Maybe they can share that with people or do. Um, in other ways, we can think of data that's accessible online. How many tweets have images in them? So we don't necessarily want to go through all of Twitter and view the whole news feed just to answer that question. So we should think beyond the interface. Now, when we think about things beyond the interface, it's not just about thinking of operationalization. It's not just how we construct questions. It can also help us think about how different media uh, exist performatively. And that doesn't mean I'm, you know, me showing off doing something like, hey, look, here's me doing some charity and then telling you I did charity. That's it's a bit it's not great to do that, and we would say that that's very performative or just showing off, but that's not what we mean. What we mean is how we shape our own behaviors in order to meet, uh, meet the expectations of some constraint. Uh, it was uh, one of the ways in which I thought it was the most persuasively considered is the discussion of is the market performative? Do we start behaving in ways that make a world more like a market because we think markets are useful? Um, we certainly didn't have markets 10,000 years ago. Uh, markets came with numeracy, but did they come before debt? Did they come before numbers? Well, that's a sort of historical question that one might, uh, one might ask and a lot of people have tried to answer. But the important part is that things were shaped along the way. So similarly, now that we have Facebook friends and Twitter followers, we do wonder, has that changed our notion of what a friendship is? Has getting automatic notifications from people changed our notion of how we approach time and how we approach responsiveness? Do we not drop into people's houses anymore because we can, well, gosh, I wouldn't do that without calling them first, but imagine before cell phones. And so performative issues are about how we, when we feed data back, when we feed constraints or designs back, we're not just revealing information, but shaping the contexts in which that information 
was created in the first place. And so we can think about performative features and about the consequences together and not just thinking, you know, how can we make this site faster or more useful? Finally, we can think about inclusion and exclusion criteria. And that happens in a lot of places, but we can think about that here in terms of what data is available and what questions we would ask of that data. You know, um, who is excluded when we observe certain data? Does their exclusion create a biased claim? If we're for example, if we're only looking at Twitter data and talking about politics, we're probably excluding voters, some voters. Which ones? And, and does that matter and how? Do such inclusions or exclusions reinforce unequal power relations? Do we then give voice to those who already have lots of voice because they produce lots of data, rather than uh, not give voice to people who just can't produce the data, don't want to, one we might consider a silent majority of some sort? Uh, and that'll be really important for us to understand the difference between phenomena out in the world, how people feel about their political life, and the data that we might get if we say download hashtag politics from uh, Twitter. Now, in order to sort of act upon this world, we, we tend to use code, and most of the rest of the book will be really code-oriented. But what do we mean by code, and what do we mean by code in practice? Well, to program or to code, is a practice of specifying some consistent phrases that will perform an operation that can be reliably repeated. Uh, now this is, if I say flip a coin, that's a consistent phrase that will perform an operation, but is that going to be uh, reliably done? Well, not really. Um, are we always going to get heads? Are we always going to get tails? Hmm. Well, in a computer program, we can specify a random number generator that will simulate a coin flip but if we give it the same seed every time, it will give you the same sequence of pseudo-random numbers. Uh, we can reliably repeat it that way. So coding is kind of like writing a recipe. Now data refers to measurements. When coding for data, we're, we're expecting consistent measurements from the world. Um, we expect to make claims about those measurements. Now what do I mean by consistent uh, measurements? I mean, uh, we don't want the first measurement of a, a friendship to be true, and then the next one to be 5 out of 10, and then the next one to be, yes, indeed, we are friends. Uh, w the first one is what we would call a, a Boolean value, uh, true or false. The second one is a, uh, an integer value, uh, maybe a float if we divide them and have a little a dot and the numbers after the dot. Uh, and the third one is a string or a set of characters. They all are data, but we're, we're not really expecting such inconsistent data. We might be expecting a series of true-false values of our friends or a series of ratings about friendship or a series of descriptions about friendship. And then we make claims about those measurements. And we can often combine the claims, but if we have different kinds of measurements, we, would, we can't combine them like at the lowest level. We would want to combine them maybe here's the insights that we learn from this kind of data and here's the insights we learn from that kind of data. Now, that being said, we don't need computers to do this. Computers can do this in a very consistent way and very, very fast. So in some ways, we often try to find questions that will work for computers, not because they're the best questions, but because they can allow us to scale things up really, really large and really consistently. Now, the world is full of exceptions and surprises. People will uh, get bad data. Data will come in that's being unpredictable or there'll be missing data. And that means our coding needs to make compromises. We can't code for every eventuality in all of our code. It's going to be too long, too brittle. Uh, even in production code for, uh, for various organizations, it's very challenging to do that. But we don't want our code to be too basic either. We don't want it to break or be fragile. And so how do we write and how do we balance so that our code is neither too simple uh, and too coarsened or too generalized, but yet really over the top and, and challenging. How do we find balance? One of the ways to address this question of how we find balance, well, I can start with this joke. And it's, I know, I know it's not a great joke, but uh, it says, um, why shouldn't you ask a computer scientist for a glass of milk? Well, it's because they'll build a barn and fill it with cows just to make the second glass that much easier. Now, I know it's not true. I have, uh, I have had a glass of milk with uh, a computer scientist before, and it did not involve a burn. 
Um, the joke works, though, because um, as a science of abstraction, computer science thinks about ways to optimize tasks, optimize its computability, and often do that within large projects. When working with computer scientists, it's common for me to find a code that's really well developed, um, very thorough, lots of methods and lots of objects, well commented, and it's just great. And I don't want to discourage you from writing great code. But I have also found code that's been way more complicated than was necessary for the task, as if every task was to be set up as the first part of a very large set of tasks. And uh, that's not going to be very useful. Sometimes you want to just explore data with one-off code or just write some code to tinker around uh, first and then go and really put it together in a nice uh, useful package. So the way I like to think about this is in terms of, and it's borrowing from economic theory, uh, fixed costs and marginal costs. So a fixed cost is the one-off cost. It's like the cost of buying an oven. And then the marginal cost is the cost of having to buy food every day, and, and, or, and I guess the electricity that's going to go into running the oven. So in code, um, code itself is already a practice of thinking about the fixed costs. Instead of, for example, going to Twitter, to somebody's page, copying the text of one tweet, pasting it somewhere, going to the next tweet, copying that text, pasting it, keep doing this, you're going to get pretty bored pretty quickly. Um, you can download all those tweets by asking for them, usually and depending on the permissions. But when you do that, you don't simply um, write more code if you want more tweets. Once you write the code for getting 10 tweets, you might be able to get 100 tweets or 1,000 tweets. As you scale up, you um, the way you scale up shouldn't make a linear cost. It, you should have some sort of... Uh, um, ways in which, once you set it up, each additional effort is uh, uh, is is easier. Uh, and so we first think of coding already just as a way to shift things from marginal costs to fixed costs. And in doing so, that means we expect some consistency and we expect to be able to build it up ahead of time. So some things are just not going to be available that way. Um, however, a lot of things are available that way. So moving to code, uh, it doesn't just save time, but it offers a, a new larger scale of observation. So now, generally speaking, we should shift marginal costs to fixed costs wherever we go, as long as it doesn't add to the overall cost. And that's part of the thing. Sometimes it does add. It's like for the sake of a real simple one-off task, we build a really big complicated program. Well, we haven't really saved on the overall costs. So we just made a really big program. Um, and maybe a really big program under the hopes that someone would use it in the future. But it's less of a great idea to do uh, than to get really clean, really cohesive code for the task at hand, uh, uh, rather than what we might call over-engineer it. Now you notice here on the left-hand side we have another icon, and this is the Jupyter Lab icon. Uh, this means that there is some examples in the Jupyter Lab code that can help us through this. So I'm going to Switch over to Jupyter Lab now and uh, have a look. You'll notice in the in the first chapter there's not a lot of code. Uh, you know you remember this DIKW data the interface. Oh, and now we go down to here. Why not to build a barn? Now remember the first thing I like to do: kernel, restart kernel, and clear all outputs. Okay, so in this first example, this is a high marginal cost. Look at this uh, email. This is a user. We're going to split the email so we get the first part of it, and then we're going to make that name one. And then we split this email, and then we're going to get the name of this email, and then we'll print it. And it should print user.example and generic.student. So look at that, it did. User.example and generic.student. Now imagine we also add in Dr. Professor. What would we do here to split up Dr. Professor? Well, we would probably have to copy this code, paste it, maybe add some new uh, numbers here. We'd have to have email three, and just many extra lines of code. Now down below, what we've done is we've, we've created this list comprehension. And if you're not familiar with list comprehensions, it might seem a bit more complicated to you. But it's a list where we um, then return another list uh, with the first list transformed. 
So, so we say here, for x in email list, here's our email list, for x in, which means for each of these elements. Uh, and then we're going to do something. What are we going to do? x dot split, which is splits it by the at symbol, and then we're going to take the first split. That's actually pretty safe as well, because let's say there, there is no at symbol, there's always going to be a zero with element. Um, but if there is an at symbol, there'll be a zero and a first element, or maybe many elements if there's many at symbols in there, and it splits by each of them. And the point is we can do this now. We've set it up with the fixed cost. We run it, and we get user at example, generic dot student, dot professor. Now, if we add a new element here, you know, if we, uh, you know, uh, Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, uh, at uh, email dot com. Uh, put that in there, make sure we get the quotations and everything, run it again, and it'll, you know, it just gets the name there. It doesn't, up here we would need to add more variables and things, and so what we've done is we've we've added to the fixed cost by creating a slightly more complicated bit of code, but then this can scale so much more effectively with just as, as many emails as we can think of going in here. So now free code as a practice and a paradigm. Now free is not the same as free and open source software, which I think is really important to get uh, to get used to if you were part of uh, you know, sort of academic coding or even coding in uh, in a professional context. A lot of software is uh, open source and it has uh, a license, and these licenses do vary from the GNU or GNU uh, public license, uh, which requires you to keep the code free, to something like MIT, which just says here. Take it and do what you like with it. Um, we're on the ladder. Uh, but free in this sense, I've, I've come up with this, so, you know, use of it as you will. Uh, but it's kind of a hierarchy. And we would say functioning, robust, elegant, and efficient. So functioning code is code that works. You know, with the expected input, the code will give the expected output. That's what we want to have first. We don't want our code to give the wrong output. And why bother with the rest of it? But what if we get the wrong input? What if uh, a server uh, uh, fails for some reason or it pauses, it can't give back the, the data on time? Does the program break? Does it have things in memory that just disappear? What if we give it the word T-H-R-E-E, -E, three, instead of the number three? Uh, is it going to be confused? Is it going to break? That's not a number. Well, I mean, it is, but it's written in a different way. Um, so is the program robust? And once a program is both functioning and robust, we might want to think about its elegance. Um, and that's his, how well is it organized? Is it organized in ways where you have specialized operations, each with their own methods, um, and you call the different methods from different parts of the program? Or is it organized in such a way where it's like line one is a step, and line two is a step, and line three, and it just kind of goes all the way down to the bottom? That, uh, that ladder is often called like spaghetti code because it's so hard to uh, put it all together. What we want is for our code maybe to refactor it or otherwise have a, an easy to understand structure that we can reuse. The other nice thing about code when it's elegant like that is that we can often change parts of the program without changing other parts of the program. So for example, if we're doing natural language processing and we split up our text, um, we might want to split it using a certain um, way of stemming the text or a certain way of creating tokens. That's a tokenizer. Uh, we might say, oh, I've learned a new tokenizer. I'm going to use that instead. The rest of the program should be able to stay where it is. And it's just that, that modular part where you use the tokenizer that you can change. So that makes the code elegant. And so this, this becomes more workable. Remember, you're always coding for at least two audiences, you now and you in the future. I mean, really, you're probably coding for more people, but remember, you're always not just coding for now. When you go back in the future and read your code, you, you, will, might, you will want to know that your code is more organized because it will be easier to get back into it. Finally, if you have all of those steps taken care of, you, you probably want your code to be efficient. Nobody likes code that's too slow or unnecessarily slow. Some forms of efficiency are premised on uh, computational complexity. And computational complexity is a deep topic, uh, and it 
somewhat intersects with the stuff that we're doing here in this book, and some of it is a bit out of scope of the book. But it is worth noting that there's ways that we can check for bottlenecks in programs, uh, we can look for how long a particular line takes to run, and we can do things such as compile it to Cython or run it on a cloud to make things more efficient. Now again, we have a Jupyter thing in the corner here, so let's have a look at that. Uh, and these are all examples of this sort of stuff here. So here's functioning code. I got a, uh, a function here called uh, square. And so when I run it, it should square these numbers. So squared number is number times number, and then we return it. Oh, Look at that, it's the number nine. Good enough. If we put in four there, it should give us 16. And the same sort of thing, okay. Now robust code. Well, what if I give it a, uh, a three? Uh, that's going to give me a type error. It's going to say there's a problem. So it functioned with the right sort of input, but not with the wrong sort of input. Now, now up here, what we've done is we have two forms of um, robustness checks. The top one is one for inclusion. So we're only going to check to see if it is a number, then do something with it. And so we say here, if is instance number, then square it. Otherwise, return this symbol right here, which is not a number. So the first one should return not a number. The second one should return 2 times 2, or 4. Uh-oh, what happened here? Well, you see, in Jupyter, remember, you have to run every cell in sequence for it to be useful for the subsequent sequences. In this case, numbers was in a cell above what we wanted to run. You'll notice it also has no uh, number there showing that it wasn't running. So let me import this. Now when I do this, it should work just fine. See, not a number, and four. Now this NAN symbol actually should be uppercase N, A, and uppercase N, according to the, uh, the guidelines from uh, the IEEE. Uh, NAN was actually, uh, um, there was like a committee determining these sorts of things, as I discovered. The important thing is that it's just a not a number symbol, but you will see it with these uppercase NAN sometimes, and sometimes you'll see it in lowercase NAN, but it means the same thing. <laughs> Now this is a different form of robustness here. This is inclusion robustness. So we check if the thing is in, then do stuff. This is exclusion robustness. This is often called duck typing, as in if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. We never asked, is duck? Like up here we asked, is it number? That's inclusion. But here we say, we're going to treat it like a duck unless something weird happens, and then we're going to do something else. Then we have a plan B. So in this case, same thing, and it gives you the same results, but it did it in a different way. In this case, it did it by first saying, oh, we're going to try this and fail, and then we'll, re in which case, we'll return NAN. But in this case, we're going to try it, and it's not going to fail, so it'll produce 4. <laughs> so depending on whether you use inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria will be by context, but they're both useful as uh, ways of tuning your code. <laughs> So for elegant, we might see here, and it's so simple that it's hard for me to show much really meaningful in elegance, but let's try. So in this case, we have square if it's an instance of number, so it has some robustness. Uh, and then we can print that, it's all good. But what if we want to make it uh, a cube uh, instead? Instead of just like two by two, maybe it's two by two by two. Uh, and so in this case, we have two exponent instead of square, but we make the default 2. So in this case, 2 exponent uh, will still give a NAN, should still give a 4, but in this case it should give 3 with the third exponent. So 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27. So we should get NAN, 4, and 27. And you see, yes, so what we've done is we made the um, method a little more general, a little more robust, a little more elegant. Now, do we want to put all possible mathematical operations in here? No. Um, in this case, I, I tried to make one that was a little more elegant, but really a lot of elegance happens, um, when you are dealing with multiple sequences of operations where some of them are repetitive and some of them you might think are going to be repetitive, but you're not sure. Uh, and so then you can use a form like refactoring in order to determine which ones are the repetitive ones and how can I just do that once in a method or a function and then call that function 
um, with different inputs and outputs every time. And that makes the code more reusable. And finally, for efficiency, I wanted to show here um, things that aren't in Python, but they're in Jupyter. Uh, they come from a, a prior package called IPython, which was the basis of Jupyter, or Interactive Python. So you actually can see some of this in Interactive Python. These are called magic commands. So this one's going to uh, tell you the time for the whole cell. And so we run this. Didn't take very much time at all. Um, 13 uh, was it microseconds, I believe. Uh, and then some time from the user. This is just the browser stuff. So super quick, really simple. Now, in this case, what we're doing down here is timing each individual line. So it's going to say, um, how long does it take to do this, to do that, and to do this? And interestingly, they all should be the same result, but they will take different amounts of time. And it's going to be a bit slow to do. Oh, well, not that slow. But look at this. Look at th And this shows you how efficiency can create, um, focusing on efficiency can actually pay off. Look at the top one here. For each new number, we're going to append it to a list. And this is kind of the same thing, but it's done inside a list comprehension. And down here, it's just take the range object itself and then just make it a list. So uh, in here, we did it in like we created a new object and appended. Here we did that using the Python's list comprehension way. And here we didn't bother. We just said, give me the results back, but make it a list. And look at the speed difference. This one right here, the top one, took an average of 33 microseconds. This one took an half that time, and this one took a mere fraction of that time. So it helps us discover that there's different ways to do the exact same thing, uh, and there could be dramatic speed differences. Now, from our perspective, they're still microseconds. But if you do this repetitively in your algorithm, then these seconds can really, or microseconds, can add up. One feature of coding that I, I don't know if it gets enough attention, but it really should, is the practice of pseudocode. Uh, and so pseudocode is when you don't write out exactly all the code that you need, but you write out little bits of that code. And those little bits of that code, or maybe just these steps that you want to take, uh, can help you structure the operations. So you would write out the steps, and then make sure you do the Python version of those steps. The important thing about pseudocode is it helps us appreciate whether there are any bottlenecks or dependencies. Like, oh, maybe we have to clean the data first before we can, we can analyze it. So you can try pseudocode for yourself by writing down some instructions and, uh, and then seeing different ways of writing it. So in the book, I cover you know, how to get the average of a set of numbers. And we look at it as mathematical notation, which is like you know, um, e, x sub i, and so forth and so forth. Um, but also like a, a written way of talking about it in a way that's kind of like Python code. Why don't you try yourself, though? Write down some instructions for how to get the average of a list of numbers. If you did that, would the computer have all the steps that it needs, or does the computer need something else? Have you made some assumptions in here that would work for you, but not necessarily for a computer? You know, maybe pseudocode is more like a recipe. And we say like an algorithm is like a recipe or, or code. But recipes like pseudocode are not the exact steps at the exact time. Sometimes it, it makes some assumptions along the way, and it just assumes that you as the person doing the recipe are going to know those assumptions. Now, uh, that's kind of the same with pseudocode. We just say, like, you know, get a series of numbers, but we don't say, um, you know, here is the input, and it is this variable to this API, or load this file. Um, it's a bit more general than that. And so... Um, Pseudocode is useful, just like recipes are useful, but it's also a bit unspecific. And we need to make sure that all the steps that we understand are there. You know, in a recipe, we wouldn't necessarily say, take the bowl out of the cupboard. We don't, wouldn't even know if your bowl is in the cupboard. But if you if it says mix something in a bowl, it, it means you, you would know. You, you know, you got to go and get your bowl for, for the mixing. Um, same sort of thing here. Does the pseudocode... Um, detail all the things that the computer needs to run. And if you're going into too much detail, is that necessary? Okay, so that's the end of, uh, that's the end of chapter one here. Uh, you can review some more of this in the book or the text if you like, but that's the summary. So social data science is a science of operationalizing social life. We, we have phenomena out in the world, and then we want to find ways to make claims about it 
but doing that using data. And so some data is going to work better than others or going to be more consistent than others. What data? Under what circumstance? That's something that we want to explore both critically, theoretically, but also empirically. So, you know, this, this paradigm, this approach, you know, it has potential to see things beyond human experience. You know, I don't really get the opportunity to, you know, float up and see the whole world as a map. Uh, even if I did have some magical superpower that allowed me to fly, all the roads would be very tiny. It's very different than if you can zoom out on, a, you know, a, a map program, OpenStreetMap or, or Google Maps. That allows us a different scale of perception. and Maybe we can say something about things when we see things at that larger scale. So sometimes data includes, sometimes it excludes, and it's worth us understanding, you know, when does it exclude and why? But when it does include, or among the things it includes, it can signal patterns, and those patterns can be meaningful. They, we can see these patterns and then start asking questions about them and, 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 and learning them. But in order to do that, we, we often want very regular or consistent measurements of data. And to apply some operation to those regular or consistent measurements of data, we can code. So to code is to analyze that data, and, and it means understanding how to, how to get the data in the right shape for our analysis tools, and to think about how much complexity we want to add into that code. We should use some complexity, certainly, so that we're minimizing marginal costs. We're not writing the same repetitive stuff over and over again. But we don't want to anticipate too much generality because that can slow us down or get in the way of being really clear about the steps we need for the analysis at hand. In order to focus on that, perhaps we can use the free mnemonic. Uh, we can think about things versus fixed version versus marginal costs, and we can use pseudocode to help us structure the steps we need. So now at the end of this chapter, I just thought I'd give you some questions to think about. Um, number one, take posting frequency, the term posting frequency as in how frequently someone posts to a social media site. What phenomena does it represent? Does it represent one phenomena or a multitude of them? If we wanted to detect bots, someone with an obsession or a troll, would posting frequency help? Would it be sufficient? Well, I think maybe not sufficient. Is it worth having that data at all? Now, is posting frequency data information or knowledge? I mean, I think it might be information. I think it might be a, it's a summary, it's a signal of data. Um, but what data is required to get that information? Uh, you might need time as well as the post, right? I mean, not just frequency, but frequency over time. We don't just say, I made 32 posts over 10 years, over one year. Uh, so being able to get the data in order to make those claims, uh, it's going to be useful. Now, what knowledge can we get from this information? Knowing that some people have different posting frequencies or a posting frequency on Twitter versus Reddit might make a difference. It might be meaningfully as a difference. So would it first require even more information to put this data into context and get some knowledge about this information? So have a think. Now for free coding, uh, I'd like to consider some questions here as well. Uh, so think of any past coding you've done. Could you have done it differently? If you go back, does the code function? Does it work? Could it be made more robust? What are some of the ways that we can make it more elegant, make it more modular, more reusable? And what are some of the ways that we might think of making it more efficient? That concludes this chapter's video lecture. Uh, the next chapter is where we really get into the tools of Python, and in particular, one called the series. We will cover ways in which you can create a series, modify it, um, uh, add to it, or change the data within it. Uh, but that's it for now. Thank you.